This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. The medical information presented on Southern Remedy is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and should not be used for any diagnostic or treatment information. The information conveyed does not create any kind of patient-physician relationship. Please consult your health care provider before making any decisions about your specific medical condition. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. Good morning and thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking, and it's a show about you and your family. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Well, today I want to speak from the heart with some advice to myself and to others about losing a loved one. I just, last week, lost my 96-year-old sweet mama, who lived a long and wonderful life. She really did. She was a hard worker, a loving person, and um, left a touch on many people. But, you know, we're never ready to have that gap left in our lives. Um, I've heard several people, not just my siblings, but others who say, well, you know, when you lo- when you leave that last parent, when you lose that last parent, um, that that now you're an orphan. And and I I kind of laugh at that because here we are in, in our senior years, many of us, and um, to use that word, uh, I've always thought of that word as a, a child under 18 who doesn't have parents and they're an orphan and they need parents to take care of them. So I always find it interesting when people use that word. Um, I haven't, but it did make me stop and think that, yeah, even though sometimes the jobs switch, right, that we go from being cared for our parents to sort of middle life where each care for their each other maybe to then life shifts and in, in their final senior years, you are caring for them. And and that I've heard from many over the years as I've done this radio show for the last 10 years, I have found that many of the caretakers, we talk about end of life for people who are approaching end of life a lot, but do we talk about the caretakers enough and how their life is so filled with the caretaking that then there's a big gap there for others. So I think I want to talk about that. Today I want to step through what we all should do when we're dealing with loss. And you know, some of us are confronted with significant loss sooner than others, but we'll all experience it. We're not going to escape it, right? It's not always, though, from the loss of death first. Sometimes it's a loss of a job or a relationship. Sometimes it's not the loss of a human being, but a pet that can feel just as profound and cause just as much grief as a human being. Right? I know many of you out there have felt that. No one of us will be spared from loss, no matter how much money and no much ha- how much status you have. So if you haven't experienced it, one, I'm shocked. And if you, if you have, I'd like to just throw out a few questions, and I'd love to have some callers. You know, I always tell you that callers make this show. Have you had a, a recent loss or a loss in the, in the past that you've struggled with? How long ago was that? And and how do you think you're doing? Do you still feel some anger about it? If you do, do you understand why you're feeling that anger? Or do you still feel sadness far out from when the incident happened? And if you do, do you need some suggestions on how to deal with it? We can talk through all of this. And, and honestly, I was asked, do you really think you can do this show? 
today. And I said, I almost think I need to. I was feeling that it was something that I felt might be helpful for me. Because I think one thing that we all try to do too hard is suppress our thoughts, suppress our grief, suppress what's going on in our minds. And many times, all that does is bottle emotion up so that you never really deal with it totally. So uh, my advice to all of you who continue to struggle with grief and have a little bit of difficulty maybe making it through, my advice to you is that you allow yourself that that hard grief that sometimes you you don't want to allow because it it really can be cleansing. And I know this sounds crazy, but it can give you almost an endorphin release um, and make you feel almost elated that you finally got it out. That's just one of those protective things that our bodies do for us. So, so keep that in mind when you're stepping through this, okay? So let's talk just a teeny bit about what, what grief is. It's natural. It's a natural response to loss. It's that emotional suffering we feel when something or someone, and I said something because it can be something that has been taken away from us. It might be a marriage, um, or it might be that little living thing, that pet, that that was your buddy all along. But but often the pain of loss can feel just really overwhelming, and, and we can experience you know, unexpected emotions, and one of them often is anger, just absolute anger that this happened. Now, with my mother, I think there was not anger from any of our family members because they knew that her quality of life was not what we wanted it to be for her. So that, but if you have a child taken away from you suddenly, or a parent or a spouse taken away from you suddenly, then you can get really angry, angry at the higher being that you go, why, God, why did you do this to me? Or it can be anger at at everything, everybody around you, anger at life. So, you know, coping with the loss of someone or someone you love is probably one of the biggest challenges you'll ever have. With that said, I do. I'm happy to know that we have a first caller. We have Rebecca in Fulton. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Tell us what your thoughts are about this tough topic, right? Well, the first thing that I'd like to say is uh, deepest condolences on the loss of your mother. Um, Thank you. It's... My mother said this years ago that... It doesn't matter how old you get, you're never raised to lose your mama. Yeah. And and I wish, I mean, I, I was a caretaker for my mother, but I certainly was not the primary caretaker for my mother. And I mean, there, and and I wish that I had done more. Mm. But uh, you know, it's, uh, but. I do know, you know, I, I know that I think that I did the best that I could, but that doesn't mean that I don't, you know, wish for, wish, wish to have had more time with her, you know. Sure. Uh, Rebecca, I think that's such a natural response, no matter how much t- time and how much love you give. And, you know, many of us, I was not, uh, we had we had ladies who sat with my mother and and so i i was not one who spent hours and hours every day with my mother but um i i did check in frequently and and i'm sure that that's what you were doing trying to be there making sure that she was comfortable and all was good but i think it's a natural response for us to to think back, did I do everything? Was did was I there enough? Did I say everything that I should have? But you just said 
a couple of words um, that that I think are very important for you to remember as you step through this, and that is for you to be able to say, I did the best I could. And if you did the best you could, that is all you you could do. And so we need to always keep those words in mind. I did the best I could at the moment. Um, you know, we all have other responsibilities, work, life, home caretaking, perhaps, you know, our our children, our siblings who might need us, our spouse, our significant other. So, so for any one person to feel the burden of all of end-of-life issues for one person, whether it's your loving parent, I don't think it's fair. I do think the burden is very hard when when you are are an only child or or perhaps the one that for whatever reason <laughs> siblings designate you to be the one. That did not happen to me. I think, you know, but I I know from others I've I've heard it. I've had cousins who who don't have large families and and you have to deal with it, right? Right. Right. I, I just, um, you know, when I talk about this, it makes me think. I mean, it's been, it's been, it's been, it's been over two years. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, I, I think about, well, did I do enough for my for my siblings? Because, because you know, my siblings, you know, some of my siblings were doing more for my mother than I was, and I, you know, I just, and I, I really do feel for those who who are only children as far as having to walk through all that because I'm sure it, it, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think this is something that I think we, I often believe families make this mistake, that there are a couple of siblings who, for whatever reason, maybe for a skill set, for ability, for time, for um, distance, or for whatever reason, there there almost always there is one or two, perhaps sibling, who who are doing more, and I think that it's always very important for those who who seem to be the designee to do a little bit more. I think it's always important to have that individual reach out if they need more, if they need a little more supportive help, that they say that. So, Rebecca, you may feel the onus is on you um, or others who are not doing the perhaps bulk of the work, but I think the onus needs to go back to those who are caretaking instead of caretaking and getting overburdened and overtired and I mean this in a kind way, that you should reach out and say, hey, I need you. If you would come in and give me a break for this, I need your help. I think that would be an important way to approach it. Um, And so that onus shouldn't all be on you. It should be on on others to know. It's just like when we talk about a husband-wife relationship, that it's really important not for a husband or a wife to think that, that you can read their mind and know what they need. Um, sometimes we find comfort in being that primary one and don't want anybody coming in and taking your place. But if if you're out there caretaking and need it, then you should ask for it. And and I, it's not a sign of weakness or a sign of inability that or a sign of less love. It only means that you're human and you might need help. And so, Rebecca, take that off your shoulders. Um you know, and and I think it would be good if you haven't talked to your siblings about that. Um, air that. Say, you know, I I just want you to know. I still, two years later, keep wondering if I, I did enough, and I I love you, and I know how much you did. That's all. That's all you can do now. And then fast forward. 
<laughs> that's that's kind of the way we all have to go, right? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for that call and, and sharing. I think it's always so helpful. Um, we have Steve in Long Beach. Hi, Steve. Thanks for calling. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, very interesting topic here. I I just share my experiences a little bit. Uh, my wife passed away in 1985. She was uh, just 30 years old. Wow. And wow. We, we had uh, three children. They were seven, five, and three. And uh, I, at the time, was uh, drinking and drugging and, you know, pretty much living the life I wanted to live. Well, my grief process, <clears throat> excuse me, that first year was just pretty much grieving for me, about me, you know, it was all about mm-hmm. me. Uh, a year and a little bit later, I got sober, cleaned up. I've been sober 39 years now. Wow. And then after after I became me again, the grieving process was all, it just came back like it had never happened to begin with. I started to be able to feel things. I wasn't anesthetized. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the second course of grief was really more of a celebration of her life and and it was more directed at my children to help them get through the process. Like I say, they were very young. Uh, and I will tell you, after all these years, there's not a day go by that goes by that I don't think about her. Mm-hmm. But I always usually think about her with a smile. I mean, I just, uh, the fortunate thing, I just like a couple of months ago had my ninth grandchild. And my thought was, I wish that she was still here to see her grandchildren. Yeah. But the grieving process, when I got the alcohol and drugs out of the way, the grieving process completely changed course. And uh, and it was kind of the way that, I, in my opinion, people should grieve. They should miss somebody. <clears throat> but by the same token, I, I hope they can appreciate what they had for as long as they had it. Yeah. That's beautiful, Steve. First of all, uh have to gr- congratulate you on on getting sober and and remaining sober for all these many years and and as you well know I know you probably didn't just do it for yourself I'm sure you did it for those three babies who needed you so desperately in oh, absolutely in their loss and and you if you had not done that no telling where they would be so congratulations on that. Um, the, you said a couple of things I have to point out. I think that you, you pointed out that first year of grief. You were, you were angry and, and, you know, just, just mad for yourself. And, and that's exactly what happens to most of us when we lose somebody who is a big part of our life, who we love. And and who is a partner, perhaps, sharing, and then all of a sudden you don't have that partner, and um, and now you're left with all of this, and I'm sure you had those thoughts. I have these three children. I am mad at you for leaving me. How could you leave yeah, me? Yeah, absolutely. Right? And the thing, the thing, too, I was, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of strange. It was... I was mad at God for taking her, but by the same token, when I when I finally got to Alcoholics Anonymous, they they wanted me to start including God in my life to help me get sober. Well, I thought, wait a minute, you just took my wife away. I'm not sure I can do this, but I did, and it worked. So, yeah. But you're right. I was I was mad. Yeah. You know what I have have talked to many about in the last few days, but in the past too, and um, is that as long as you have that person in their in your heart, and you have those smiling, positive memories, like you said, Steve, to be able to remember her, to think about her today, and to smile about some of those wonderful things she did or said. Or maybe ju- just that that look to you uh, that she gave, that look of love or that touch. Um, 
to to keep that in your heart and to keep bringing it up that makes that individual stay alive in your mind and and those are important and you know your children to for them to be allowed to have those kinds of memories so very important so in the grief process you've got to get through the anger now you brought up another whole issue and that is so many times people think that they need to take some sort of medication to calm them about their grief or to self-medicate with drugs or alcohol to to um, blur the pain. But it's a bad thing to do because what happens is exactly what happened to you. It suppresses it, right? It prolongs it. So Absolutely. that came back when you were sober and able to really think clearly and allow your feelings, your whole brain to absorb it, and for that emotional center in your brain to really understand it. You know, it's processing in the front part of your brain, but in the deeper recesses of your brain, allowing it to really absorb the the feelings and um, step through it. So... I think uh, just having you call in and share that is is so very important for on on many levels, Steve. So um, I would love to. How are your children doing now? They're adults. Oh, they're great. Yeah, they're 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 great parents, and uh, uh, they they've learned from my mistakes. I believe. I mean, they. Uh, None of them hardly drink at all. They might have a beer once in a while, but they're they're good family people. I, I you know, like I say, three kids, nine grandkids, and everybody's doing well. And uh, you know, they uh, they remember their mother fondly. They get together uh, every year on her birthday, and then they gather at her cemetery and put flowers on her graves. And uh, and uh, they've actually kind of included her name and a couple of the names of my grandchildren. So. Yeah, it's it's a it's it's a healthy. I believe it's a they have a healthy relationship with their mother, and they they have a healthy re- relationship with life. In my opinion, that's wonderful. Wow, what a testament to you! So I'll just say it one more time, Steve. Congratulations on being able to deal with a very very difficult situation and bring it forward and save those children and give them a positive life. So thanks again. Well, thank you very much. I I appreciate the topic, by the way. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. You know, I want to hear your stories. Um, I can give you some advice uh, as we talk through, or if you have some advice back to the listeners, please feel free to share it. Okay, we're going to go back to the phones. We have Bert. I believe he's on the road. Hi, Bert. Thanks for calling. Tell us what your thoughts are today about the grief process. Well, I just caught part of uh, a female caller a few minutes ago. Um, Mm -hmm. Didn't know the full topic. Uh, I'm sorry for your loss and the grief uh, process ahead for you. Um, Thank you. We've had to to learn with our... um, in-laws across the street from us uh that grief is um it's what i call a roller coaster that people uh ride at different speeds and take the highs and the lows and the turns at different times um uh, my wife has had to grieve as her father uh, became ill and then died with us as primary caregivers and now it's such a different dynamic that has been ongoing Mm -hmm. that that the grief that she is getting from her mother, who's 93, who's been incredibly capable all her life, but the grief she gives my wife for trying to do things to help her, um, and it 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 just um, paralyzes my wife on stuff that needs to be done for her right. uh, her mother, and and some of it's paralysis by analysis. She doesn't know where to start. Right. She needs help dealing with her mom. She needs help. Her mom was, she's 93 and doesn't have a primary care physician, essentially. Mm-hmm. So we need to get her to stop driving. She's resistant to it, um, indignant to it. We're, we're calling out her 
her inabilities now, blah, blah, blah. So we need help on how to deal with her when she's uh, combative with it almost. Mm -hmm. uh, and she didn't even have a physician to, to refer them to. Yeah. So that would probably be primary number one, Bert, I will say, is to find uh, a good internist or family physician who can help you with that because I would you you need to go ahead and identify someone I don't know if your mother it sounds like she must not have significant health problems if she's still right. um, able to drive and often that is the case um, but I, I will say that one of the hardest parts, and my husband and I were just talking about that, his father had great difficulty when we took the keys away from him, and um, but we did, and he was not happy with it, and he tried to trick us or, or trick his friends into giving him, him keys back to his truck. He was a farmer and, and just loved the land and loved driving around the land, so it was tough. But Were y'all able to use a medical excuse or a medical per professional to deliver us for the news? Um, actually, we didn't. We we actually uh, knew. I mean, the medical doc that we had attached said absolutely he should not drive, and and we said that. But but honestly. I think you as loved ones who can just say you can be mad at me, you can not care, but there are two reasons we're taking it away. One, for your safety, and two, for the safety of others. We cannot, if you don't care about hurting yourself, we care about you, and we also care about the danger in you perhaps hurting others, because it it could happen very easily, Bert. You know that. And so I think yep. it's very important for y'all to take a handle on that right now. And and let me, you know, we can, we can talk about all the other legal aspects and everything, but on another show, not me, but, but I will say for the safety of your mother and others, and others. You know, I was lucky in that both my father and mother knew when they shouldn't be driving anymore. So we didn't have to make a big hoopty la. But it doesn't mean that your mother in law is a bad person. It means it sounds like she's fiercely independent and, and trying yeah, to and she started getting some dementia too where yeah. she, that's where she's so she's so uh you know, she'll say, Well, I don't remember the doc telling me that. Yeah. So we're 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 almost hoping to get the doc and have them say verbally and get it in writing, do not drive. Yeah. Um, we don't know how quickly we can make that happen. Um, I'm um, not sure in what area of the state you live, Bert, and yeah. you don't have to disclose that, but I would say that, you know, if you have trouble, I would call – uh, a good primary at the advice of some of your friends or perhaps who you use, go ahead and call them. Say we need to get um, get an appointment made just for routine care, and and then then at least you have that link. They could, I think, most good family physicians or internists could do that. If you live in the Jackson area, certainly. Um, the University Medical Center has a great family medicine department, and they could connect you. So just some suggestions to do it. But I think this is something that that is, is very important. And to remember that individuals with dementia often have a personality change and can make life difficult for the people who are trying to caretake. But you're going to have to steal yourself to to just state what needs to happen. And if that means that um, you're taking the keys away, if that means that somebody needs to come in and make sure she takes medication or cleans the house, even if she doesn't want anybody interfering with her business, you just are going to have to take charge and do it. And I, I know you, you said the word paralyzed, and and I have a family member that I love who sometimes is paralyzed because she's stepping through that right now. 
And um, but but you just have to get make yourself step beyond the paralysis. There's a great geriatrics department also. I didn't mention that at the university. Um, Medical Center of Mississippi Medical Center that you could contact. And if if you don't want to go over there and be seen, I bet they could share just some general information with you. And then is what? It inappropriate? Huh? Is it inappropriate to say, hey, we need you to tell her stop? No. Stop driving? No, not at all. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say it in front of her. I would say it um, sure. as an aside. Um, and, you know, because you want her to to be able to keep her dignity and you know many times uh docs who are used to seeing geriatric patients uh, have the right phrases to help through that but but i think that it at at some point you do just have to have the courage to step through that and and make sure you're keeping her safe and others safe Keep in mind, I mean, you know this. Think about having having something happen with her if she has early dementia, getting confused on what what the gas pedal is versus the brake. That has happened often. And, you know, people drive through buildings um, or through stoplights and run into somebody. So keep that in mind. on on family members helping she's got a brother and a sister that that aren't either able uh due to distance um to help right and if you're an only child i could almost see where it's easier you're not thinking somebody else may or you're not disappointed in that they don't if you're the only child you know it's up to you Mm -hmm. you may get you may get professionals you may get church friends neighbors to help you but you know it's all on you. You don't have to get, so to speak, disappointed or expect help from other family members. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you just put put out a positive point of having a, a smaller family instead of the larger because sometimes it can be that you get disappointed and angry and you don't know where they're coming from. You know, perhaps it's somebody who just can't handle it. Um, maybe it's somebody who's selfish. Who knows? But sometimes it's just not being able to step through the grief. So you're right. Um, and and hopefully those people who do have their it, their you know, they're tapped on the shoulder and it that they have church members or or friends who who recognize that and can step in and help. But again, I, I would implore everyone if you feel like you need help to ask for it. People don't know what you need until you tell them what they need, what you need. And so that's really, really important. I took that note um, as you were, as you were wrapping up the last conversation. Uh, well, well, good luck on your journey. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Good luck to you. Um, we're going to stay on the phones. Orson in West Point has been very patiently waiting. Thanks for calling Orson. Yes. Um, good um, morning. Um, uh, first of all, I have to apologize for your loss. Thank you. Uh, I am with you. Um, you're listening to a miracle, dear. I um, had COVID. My mother had COVID, and my brother had COVID. Mm. I lost them both, respectively, oh. one in August and one in September. Oh, Orson, I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you. Um, I died three times. I didn't have no oxygen in my body. I was down in the the floor, uh, excuse me, I was down in Greenville, uh, the Delta Regional Medical Center. Um, I died three times. I had the whole out-of-body experience. Wow. Um, When um, when I mean by the out-of-body experience, I saw a way still of how God or that Supreme being, how he judges people and he's trying to wait for you. My soul was in his favor, but the people on the right of me, they were not in his favor. So all of a sudden, I heard a revving like a motor. Um, and the next thing I felt, it got real hot and the door opened up. And it was, I mean, blistering flames coming out. And a voice appeared saying to those people, we're not in God's favor. Hell is for those liars, cheaters, non-believers, and deceivers. 
pushed them in there, and they immediately shut that, shut that gate. And the next thing I know, I got had a strong, lightheaded sensation. And when I opened up my eyes, I saw the beautiful clown, beautiful. And I turned around to look back, and the hospital I was staying in was getting smaller and smaller as I was ascending up into up into the sky, up into heaven. And so I saw a huge light bright on about ten times the brightness of the sunshine. And to the left of me, I saw a figure that looked like my mother, wings and all over there. And she was walking in the light. And so when it came around for me to walk in the light, I ended up coming right back down into heaven. And I opened up my eyes back in the bed. Wow. And that's why I tell people, um, you don't, um, because I've always, I've worked in the retail profession as a retail manager for 30 years. And I was always got a goal to, you know, give the American dream, have my own place, and, you know. And, you know, you pray to God about these things, but, you know, I got to tell people, you have to be careful what you pray for and wish for, because when it comes to you, it may not be to your life. And I found that out. And that's why I tell people, I try to have a testimony to everybody. When you're praying, ask the Lord for a praying spirit. To, I mean, ask him, Lord, when I pray, give me what to say. Or better still, I want to make sure my eyes are dotted and the teeth are crossed. Mm. Because I'm sure you, whatever you pray for, if you're not specific, it's going to, God is going to answer your prayer. It's probably going to be your life. And so I'm just sharing, I want to share this testimony to everybody. Wow. Um, wow, Orson, that is quite a, quite a experience that you had and you know i've heard i bet there are other listeners out there who have had experiences like that and those those sort of out of body experiences where you you feel like you really do um ascend and so i i think that um there are a couple of things. Uh, you had two major losses. I hope you're stepping through that okay. I hope that you are able to uh, deal with those losses uh, okay. It sounds like you have your emotions in the right place, and um, it sounds like you saw something very beautiful to look toward to the future. So uh, I hope that you you have support here on earth right now for for your uh, ability so that you, you can move. That. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that point up. Um, things happen for a reason, and God will show you people who are supposed to have your interest in yeah. So I had to go through a family of rigmarole, and I have banned people from my house. And I, um, don't, I already told them I do not want to see them again. Mm-hmm. I'm down. After mom had passed away, they thought I was going to die and was dead also. They went into my house and started taking over things. Yeah. And so, and when um, I found out the truth, you know, I, you know, I put my foot down and, you know, and I'm like, if that's family, I don't need it. And so I just spend them and I forbid them to see them. Yeah. Orson, we're getting some. Um, background noise. I'm sorry. Um, I will just say that 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 is one area in which we do find can be really problematic. And so that's another thing that I would implore everyone to do that in the loss of a family member, that it's really important to make sure that that uh, before everybody starts deciding how to divide things up, that it's really important to step back, let emotions go away, take some deep breaths, and allow those those emotions to settle down and process. Um, that is something that should never, ever happen. And so I'm sorry that happened to you. Um, I just want to remind everybody that you really should have all 
all of your stuff in order. And and that's another whole show. I know we have several um, that ha- Richard Courtney, who is an estate planning lawyer and an elder lawyer, does a great job of uh, just making sure that that uh, uh, giving advice on estate planning and and. And even if you don't have a big estate, even if you have just something very small to make sure that you outline in a will what you want, why you you don't have to say why you want it. You just have to say what you want, who you want to get it, who you want to 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 take care of things for you. So really important to make yourself step through that kind of thing. And so, Orson, I hope that you have, since that happened, gotten things in order for you. And that would be my advice to everyone. It makes life so much easier for those who remain to know that you stated it very clearly, what's supposed to happen and and who's supposed to take care of it. Okay, thanks for that, Orson, and good luck. Um Sue's been patiently waiting in Beaumont. Hi, Sue. Thanks for calling. Hi. How are you today? I'm doing all right. Thank you. I'm wondering why um, the focus is strictly on seniors and elderly who need their keys taken away because a lot of families have members of the family who are drug addicts or alcoholics, and uh, they're out weaving and wavering on the road every day. They're the ones you hear about in the newspaper that cause most accidents and deaths and accidents. Why aren't, why, aren't there, why aren't there some kind of uh, laws and restrictions about taking the keys away from those people? You know, Sue, that's a great question. And we all know the story about the drunk driver who's um, been pulled over and arrested two or three times. And, and you know, then they kill a bunch of people and they end up in jail. Um, it's just an absolute crime in my mind that that we have to get to that point. And so, um, you know, there are some new devices that stop people from driving now, at least alcoholics. Now, I don't know if there's anything akin to that for drug addicts, I don't think. But your point is well taken. Of course, we were talking about grief, Sue, and and not not just elders but any kind of grief it has focused more on on the elderly but but overall that's a really good point and i do think that as we move along and get more sophisticated in in electronic devices and and all that we'll be able to have devices that won't allow cars to start um, unless it detects that you don't have drugs or alcohol in your body. Mm-hmm. But I, I do think that the tolerance level of allowing it to go on is too high. That, you know, if you get pulled over one time for drunk driving, perhaps, even if it was a young person who made a mistake, it still is possible that it could happen again, perhaps. I don't know. I don't know that answer and I, I think that that would be something that needs to be looked at and approached by people smarter than I am. But um, I think your point is well taken, Sue. Thanks for that call. Thank you. Um, let's go to our last caller. We have Mike in Madison. Hi, Mike. Thanks for calling. Oh, good morning. Uh, my condolences to you and your family. Um, Thank I you. I used to work at UMC and know you from there, but... I wanted to point out, especially for the gentleman who was uh, talking about his uh, elderly relative, area, every county in the state is served by an area agency on aging, and they have folks there who know uh, all about the resources in their particular areas. They're based out of the planning and development district. So there are some folks in the area who would know about the resources that uh, maybe that family could take advantage of. Well, that's great information. Mike, how would one access those numbers? Is there a particular title that each area has? They're they're called Area Agency on Aging, and they can reach them through their uh, planning and development districts, or I'm sure that uh, the county, if they call their county government office, I'm sure they could get some uh, help getting in contact, but 
they'll be it should be in the uh, you know Google or if you have a mm-hmm. phone book it should mm-hmm. be under area agency on aging. Okay, we will make sure that we have that posted on our podcast when we post that uh, because I think that's very helpful. And and Mike, as you you know, um, that this is something that that probably affects almost every single family that has a, a se- senior individual, but not just for taking keys away, but but other resources on aging. You know, I was stepping through this process that was definitely, you know, my father died fairly suddenly. My mother died. It was a more prolonged process. And we learned much more about hospice, services that were available. We had a wonderful experience with the hospice services that came to our home. I think sometimes people think that they need to put their loved one in a hospice facility to be able to step through that, but you don't. Um, and so I I do think there are resources out there, and, and as Mike just pointed out, you know, you can search on the Internet almost anything, and I would encourage people to do that. The other thing that they should do is reach out to their physician to ask for this, not to forget that physicians don't just deal with the living, but they often deal with the those individuals who are in the last portion of their life. And so to make sure that you reach out, even if you don't want the physician to intervene on anything that's going on and you don't want any more treatment, but if you you may want that added support. And it to me, it was phenomenal. So, um, Mike, thanks for calling in about that and reminding people to access the services that are out there. That's one thing wonderful about our United States, right? (laughs) That we have so many good services out there. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, in the last minute of our show, I just want to remind everybody that that there are some, some myths and facts that we have to remember And I said it at the beginning of the show. I'll say it at the end now. The myth is that if you just try to ignore the pain of grief for whatever reason it is, that it'll go away. And the the real truth is that ignoring your pain may keep it bottled up and it'll surface only later. So make sure that for real healing that you allow yourself to grieve. You allow yourself to talk through um, your your anger, talk through your sadness, and talk through what support you might need to get to the other side of this so that you can allow yourself to really, really then relish and smile in the positive memories of that loved one or that loved pet or whatever there was. So I hope this was helpful to all of you listeners It was helpful to me, and I thank you for bearing with me on this. If you'd like to hear this show again or any past episodes, you can listen to the podcast on your favorite podcast app by searching Southern Remedy, Relatively Speaking. This show is a production of MPB Think Radio, and it was engineered by my producer, Jay White, and I believe he was the call screener, too. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking right here on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public